Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Friday Ramblings. We are here, as always, to lay some stuff out and pique your interest in some wonderful entertainment because that's what we do here at Roulette Productions. We're going to do something a little different today. I've been wanting to get back into discussing the histories of various championships, especially the WWE, since it is such a long-running promotion and thus has had many decades of history history in which to rely upon and draw championships from. However, instead of doing the typical championships most people think of, what we're going to do today is a grab bag of the more obscure championships, whether it be because they are from just so far back, uh, like the days of Vince McMahon Sr., or they were just not really used for long. These are titles that are part of the rich history of WWE, WWF, WWWF, but as I said, usually aren't given a lot of focus and love from people at large. Now I'm going to go ahead and say that some of these, because this will come up when we discuss the championships and their histories, were created as part of a deal between WWF and primarily NJPW, aka New Japan Pro Wrestling. Because that's just something that was done back in the day as part of the talent trading and the benefits of the market presence. It's like, hey, you know what? Um, we'll give you guys a championship that we'll sanction, so, you know you can kind of get a little bit of our rub, we get a little bit of your rub over here and other ways. It's a thing. That's how you got clout back in the day. Because that's what we call it now. Call it getting that clout. You want that internet clout. Well, if you want wrestling clout, you got to have some gold around your waist. Or on your shoulders, why you must be aware it now. Still, just keep that in mind that when I make references to an NJPW deal, this is what I'm referring to. It is an old deal of, hey, we'll kind of share talent, um, do business with each other in a few different ways. Because, well, back then, WWE or F or WWWF didn't really do business in other countries despite World being in their name. You know, this was the days of the old territories where even running nationally wasn't something most people did. And even in Vince McMahon's early national days, he couldn't afford to travel internationally, let alone compete with other people that were already embedded as known promotions. So, you make deals with them which was part of his territory expansion policy, sometimes he flat out just bought the other promotions. Kind of like he eventually did with ECW and WCW. But that's more modern history. It's much more well documented. Let's get into the obscurity fun. First thing we're going to cover is the WWF Canadian Championship. We're going to discover this one first, not because it's the oldest, but because it is the shortest. Having only been in existence for approximately 157 days, it was used in the back half of 1985 after the World Wrestling Federation took over the Montreal-based International Wrestling, aka Lutte Internationale, promotion. Upon joining the WWF roster, IW mainstay and booker Dino Bravo was billed as the WWF Canadian Champion when they would tour Canadian cities until the title was abandoned, as I said, several months later. So, it was basically a way to keep Dino Bravo over in Canada because, I mean, it's... For those of you who saw the Dark Side of the Ring episode about Dino Bravo and his murder, this is kind of established news, but for those who haven't, you have to understand, right after that buyout, because Lute Internationale had been such a 
big promotion in that part of Canada. Dino Bravo was over as big as anybody in the 1980s was. Like, you know, he was Canada's own Hulk Hogan. So it made sense to, at least for a while, until they could firmly transition his identity into that of a WWF star, to transition him out of that main event perennial champion role. Next up, we have one that is more familiar to people as a trivia fact, but is still its individual title history is sometimes glossed over, and that is the WWF North American Heavyweight Championship. Again, this was another relatively short-lived title, having only been in existence for, oh, do 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 um a couple of years. Let's see, trying to do some quick math here. That's about six fifteen eight fifteen eight. Um about eight hundred and twenty days approximately. And only featured three champions. It was originally established as the WWF North American Heavyweight Championship on February 13, 1979, before the company was renamed and dropped the first W. Well, actually, the second W, because it was Worldwide Wrestling, and then became World Wrestling. The inaugural champion was Ted DiBiase, and the final champion was Seiji Sakaguchi. It is considered to be the spiritual predecessor to the promotion's Intercontinental Championship, after Pat Patterson was awarded that title as a result of a fictitious one-night tournament declaring that Pat Patterson had beaten the current champion, Mr. Sakaguchi, to un as well as the fictitious South American Heavyweight Championship in the course of the tournament, thus unifying them into a new belt. <laughs> so let's run that through again. They had a tournament that never happened in which a belt that existed was allegedly won and also a belt that never existed was won and thus the two championships reunified into the Intercontinental Championship we all know and love. Now, the tournament was infamous, mostly because of how over Pat Patterson was at the time and how big a deal the Intercontinental Championship would be in the WWF. And as such, it is a running joke among many wrestling promotions if you want to introduce a new title and just throw it on a guy instead of having an initial winner becomes the first champion match to say in a tongue-in-cheek manner, oh, he won it in a tournament in Brazil, as a reference to this. But still, as I said, the original champion was Ted DiBiase, who was awarded the title when he signed with the company, officially being presented as the champion for the first time in Allentown, Pennsylvania, held it for 126 days before losing it to Pat Patterson, who also won it at a show in Allentown, Pennsylvania, held it for 158 days before Seiji Sakaguchi won it in Otaru, Japan, and held it for 532 days. Thus, Mr. Sakaguchi is way beyond the champion who legitimately held the belt for the longest time. Still, as we said, the title was eventually abandoned, so Mr. Sakaguchi never technically lost it. And it would live on as part of the Intercontinental Championship. Nowadays, they 
kind of sort of rebirthed it as the NXT North American Championship, no heavyweight involved, since weight divisions aren't really a thing in pro wrestling anymore. So, there's a little bit of a legacy still attached to it. Good times. And of course, uh, Mr. Sakaguchi was a mainstay of New Japan Pro Wrestling, which is where he spent most of those 532 days defending the title. He also held title, other titles in New Japan, most, um, mostly tag team championships, as well as titles in Japan Wrestling Association, NWA Hollywood, NWA Polynesian Wrestling, and the European Wrestling Union. So Mr. Sakaguchi did get around. Speaking of New Japan Pro Wrestling, we have the WWF World Martial Arts Heavyweight Championship. It was created on December 18th, 1978 and awarded to NJPW mainstay Antonio Inoki by Vincent J. McMahon, a.k.a. Vince Sr., upon Inoki's arrival in America. Title is known for being contested in matches billed as shoot wrestling fights, something that Inoki was known for throughout his career, competing in alleged shoot fights. Inoki, of course, is one of the great living legends of the international wrestling scene. WWF World Martial Arts Heavyweight Championship was contested solely in NJPW after the promotion became unaffiliated with the WWF in 1985. This is one of those cases where, because WWF really only created it as a gesture of good faith and good business and respect to Mr. Inoki, when the business deal ended, they continued to allow him to defend it because it was his belt. <laughs> Let him do whatever he wants with it, basically. During the 30th anniversary of Inoki's career, NJPW created the Greatest 18 Club, a Hall of Fame. NJPW then created a new title, the Greatest 18 Championship. The Greatest 18 Championship was represented by the former Martial Arts Championship, Physical Belt, and was awarded to Ricky Choshu in 1990. Joshu lost the title to the Great Muda in 92, and Muda retired the title on September 23rd of that year in order to focus on the IWGP Heavyweight Championship title defenses. Real quick, for those people not familiar with New Japan Pro Wrestling, the majority of titles in New Japan and Pro Wrestling are referred to as IWGP titles, the International Wrestling Grand Prix, which is a fictional governing body that tends to cover the administration of creation of championships and declarations of contenders, as well as making sure all the title matches are official and done by the rule books. It's one of those things New Japan does as part of its aspect of maintaining the real sports feel of professional wrestling over in Japan. We do not judge them for this. Just note that when people refer to IWGP, it is the same thing as saying NJPW. So besides Antonio Inoki, the official WWF Martial Arts Heavyweight Championship was held by Shoto Chochishivli. Hold on, this, this is slightly... I, I'm, I'm reading this name, so I'm, I'm going to have to guess a little bit on the pronunciation. Shoto Chochishivli. Um, at the event known as Battle Satellite in Tokyo Dome, after Inoki had held the title for approximately 3,780 days. For reference, this would be from December of 1978 until April of 1989. So he held it for about 10 and a half years without losing it. That is pretty impressive. Tony Inoki, however, would win it back 31 days later and hold it for another 220 days. For the title was officially abandoned at the end of 1989. So, there we go. 
Next, we have the WWWF United States Heavyweight Championship. Once again, we have to clarify this is from the Worldwide Wrestling Federation days, and this title is not considered the same lineage as the modern WWF United States Championship, which is actually descended from the WCW and for it, NWA United States Championship, that title will be discussed on a future rambling because that is a title with a very rich history. This is a different belt. The WWWF United States Heavyweight Championship was used sporadically between 1963 and 1976 and would occasionally serve as a promotion secondary singles championship. After the title was tried for good, it was replaced after a three-year interval with the previously mentioned North American Heavyweight Championship as the official secondary title. It should be noted that the WWWF was at one point part of the National Wrestling Alliance and thus the company also hosted a version of the NWA, United States Heavyweight Championship, for several months before creating their own U.S. Championship. So, let's go through this. The initial champion was Bobo Brazil, who won it in April of 1963. He would then lose it to Johnny Bear End 63 days later, who lost it back to Bobo Brazil after a month, who held it for another couple months before losing it to Johnny, who held it for 41 days before losing it to Bobo, who finally settled in for a title reign of 1,335 days. This occurring in October of 1963. Eventually in June of 67, Ray Stevens, incredible wrestler, would win it. However, he would only hold it for 67 days before Bobo Brazil won it back. A month later, he would lose it to the Sheik, who managed to hold on to it for 429 days before Bobo Brazil won it back for 57 days. The Sheik won it for three weeks before Bobo Brazil settled into another long reign of 687 days before vacating it due to injury. This would lead us to January of 1971, where Pedro Morales defeated Freddie Blassie in a tournament final, holding it for 32 days before vacating it after winning the WWWF Championship. This is something that has come up a couple times in some of our previous videos about title histories. Back in the day, promotions had a rule that a champion could only hold one title at a time and that if they were to win a championship while holding a championship, one of those titles would have to be vacated, usually the one the champion already held going into the match because why would you challenge for a belt, win it, and then immediately decide you didn't want it? That's kind of a waste of a title match. That, and as we said, the World Heavyweight Championship was more prestigious. After being vacated, Bobo Brazil would win it for a final time, holding it for 1,837 days before it was officially deactivated on March 1st of 1976. Seven weeks later, though, Bobo Brazil would journey to the NWA's Detroit territory, where his old rival, the Sheik, competed, winning the Detroit NWA version of the United States Heavyweight Championship. This means that there were combined reigns of Bobo Brazil held it for a total of 4,072 days, the Sheik holding it for 450 days, for Johnny Barron held it for 72, Ray Stevens for 67, and Pedro Morales' single reign of 32 days. This was basically Bobo Brazil's title belt, but as great as Bobo Brazil was, nobody can fault the promotion for bouncing it back to him over and over. And yes, for those of you who had trouble keeping count, that was a total of seven reigns. Out of eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, seven out of thirteen reigns. Next up, we have the WWF International Heavyweight Championship, which was used by Capital Wrestling Corporation, aka WWWF, the World Wrestling Federation, New Japan Pro Wrestling, and briefly the Universal Wrestling Federation. This one's going to get a little fun. The title was originally 
introduced in July of 1959, where it was won by Antonio Rocca, who defeated Buddy Rogers in a match. However, by October of 1963, the title was vacated and later became inactive until June of 1982, where it was won by Tony Parisi, who then lost it a couple months later to Gino Brito, who would then, like, <laughs> about a, two weeks later, lose it to Tatsumi Fujinami, who had made a rare trip to America. He then settled down and held it for 216 days before losing it in Japan to Riki Choshu for 123 days. Fujinami won it back, hold it for another 234 days. Eventually, though, he, he returned to America where he dropped the belt to Akira Maeda before journeying to the UWF to defend the title, losing it to Tatsumi Fujinami in July 5th of 1984. It would then subsequently be vacated a little over a year later after a double disqualification match against Super Strong Machine, aka Junji Harata. And officially the belt would be split, would be deactivated a few months later on Halloween of 1985 when New Japan WWF's deal that we have mentioned a couple times before ended. We now have the WWF slash WWF Junior Heavyweight Championship, which existed from 1967 through 1985. Although it did return, the physical belt returned in April of 1994 when the belt was used as a trophy for the first ever Super J Cup, which was won by Wild Pegasus, aka Chris Benoit. Yay! Paul DeGlaze won the title initially in September of 1965, losing it about a month later to Jono DeFazio, who would himself lose, to, lose it to Jackie Nicholas, who lost it back to Johnny, who lost it back to Jackie, who lost it back to Johnny, who lost it back to Jackie, who are finally losing it for good back to Johnny, DeFazio, who then vacated the belt in 1972 upon retirement. Now, you've noticed I have not mentioned any days. That is because due to these belts being defended at house shows and this being the mid-60s to late 60s, when there was not a lot of independent documentation of wrestling results, nobody's actually 100% sure how long the individual title reigns were. Um, or exactly what cities the belts were lost in. We just know that these title changes have been reported by fans and early journalists. So, unfortunately, this is something that has plagued a lot of wrestling historians. Six years later, the belt would be reactivated on January 20th, 1978, when Carlos Jose Estrada defeated Tony Gurria to reestablish the belt. However, only three days later, he would lose it to our friend Tatsumi Fujinami, who would hold it for 617 days, as well as taking it over to New Japan Pro Wrestling, where he would lose it to Ryo Mago for two days, for losing it back to Fujinami, Held it for another 789 days before vacating it when he entered the heavyweight division. Again, this is back when weight divisions were really important in wrestling. Although in Japan, they do still have proper weight divisions and take it more seriously. So, good points and props to New Japan. The original Tiger Mask would hold the belt for 119 days, defeating Dynamite Kid, 
our old buddy from the British Bulldogs tag team, and whose rivalry with Tiger Mask is considered one of the all-time great feuds in all of pro wrestling, uh, putting on matches that decades later were still being studied by young wrestlers. Eventually, Tiger Mask would vacate the title due to injury, where it was won by his other rival, Black Tiger, who held it for 20 days before losing it back to Tiger Mask. Black Tiger, for reference, would defeat Gran Hamada, another great Japanese legend whose daughters are also part of the wrestling tradition in his family. Tiger Mask would be injured by Dynamite Kid in a tag team match causing him to vacate the belt. Now my kid would compete against Kuniaki Kobayashi for the title. However, no winner was declared, and it would be June 13th before an official champion would be redeclared when Tiger Mask journey to Mexico was part of a cross-promotional event and won it back. He would then vacate it when he retired 60 days later. However, it was not until February 7th, 1984 when Dynamite Kid won a tournament final match over the Cobra to hold the championship, which he held it for 237 days before vacating it when he left Japan to join the WWF full-time, forming the British Bulldogs tag team with his cousin Davey Boy Smith. Cobra would win it back at a WWF show in New York City, defeating Black Tiger for the belt, holding it for 143 days, for losing it to Hiro Saito for 69 days before Cobra won it back, holding it for 95 days until the New Japan WWF business split deactivated the title. So, another fun belt held by a few legends. And I will definitely go through the Tiger Mask gimmick concept due to the fact that it is a gimmick that has been handed down to various wrestlers, as well as the related Black Tiger. Uh, Black Tiger was, long story short, was a heel character created exclusively to feud with Tiger Mask as both characters were based off a pre-existing manga. So, there you go. Look forward one day to a Tiger Mask Black Tiger rambling. That's when you definitely, I gotta definitely sit there and do some research over first. Finally, we are going to briefly discuss the WWF Light Heavyweight Championship. Now, we're not going to now, this is kind of an odd belt because this is one that was competed primarily outside of the WWF due to their business deals, but would later migrate back to WWF before being merged with the WCW Cruiserweight Championship, WWF choosing to continue the Cruiserweight Championship's lineage due to the fact that WCW had done a much better job of booking the cruiserweights and WWF had done the light heavyweights and therefore the cruiserweight belt had more prestige to it. The WWF light heavyweight championship was first introduced in Japan in a tournament which ended with Pedro Aguayo defeating Gran Hamada to become the first recognized champion. He would hold it for 183 days before losing it to Fishman. Only held it for 15 days for Pero Aguayo won it back for a week before losing it to Chris Adams. He of world class fame. He would hold it for 56 days for Pero Aguayo would win it back, holding it for 129 days before losing it to Gran Hamada. I told you the guy was a legend, he keeps showing up. Only it for 130 days before losing it to Paraguay, who had managed to hold on to it for 203 days before losing it to Villain 03. 
for 140 days. Paraguay would have been back for 254. Gran Hamada would have been back for a month. Freeland 03 settled into a nice 826 day reign, losing it to Fishman. Held it for 120 days before losing it to Paraguay for another 130 days. Title was eventually vacated after title defense against Villano 03 ended in controversy. Villano 03 would then defeat Paraguay in a rematch for the championship. About five weeks later, holding on for 209 days before losing it to Rambo. Who held it for 281 days before Villano 3 won it for another 400 days, losing it to Sangre Chicano for two months. Paraguayo for 49 days. Sangre Chicano won it back for 175 days. Villano 3 held it for another 280. Pegasus Kid has returned to our ramblings as he won it for 560 days. Villano 3 got it back for another 110. El Signo, 563 days. Villano 3 had another reign in 176 days for vacating it after he signed a contract with the competing Promel promotion, aka Promo Azteca. This has brought us all the way up to January of 1995. In June of 1995, the title would finally be unvacated when Era Flash won it in a tournament final, holding it for 282 days before the great Sasuke won it for 90 days, losing it to El Samurai for a month and a half before the great Sasuke won it for another two months before it got merged into NJPW's J-Crown where it was won by Ultimo Dragon for 85 days Jushin Thunder Liger held it for 183 days as part of the J-Crown El Samurai wins it and the rest of the J-Crown back I really do got to, got to discuss the J-Crown one day, it is an insane concept that I don't know if it would ever work in modern days now Samurai held it for 35 days before losing it to Shinjiro Otani for 87 days before November 5th of 1997 J-Crown was officially vacated and Shinjiro Otani returned 6 of the co-opted belts ex- keeping the IWGP Junior Weight Heavyweight Championship for himself. The belt was then returned to the WWF for its modern light heavyweight era, in which case it was then won in a tournament by Takamichi Noku. Who would hold it, hold it for 350 days before losing it to a month to Christian? Who would lose it to Dwayne Gill under his Gilbert gimmick? Who held it for 445 days? Most of these, this reign was because they kind of put the belt on Gilbert and then forgot all about him and the championship. Eventually, he would lose it to S.A. Rios, who had previously competed during Takamichi Noku's days as Aguila. Hold it for a month before losing it to Malenko, who lost it 35 days later himself to Scotty to Hottie Hill. Held it for nine days for losing it back to Dean Malenko, who now settled into another mostly overlooked 322-day reign. For reference, folks, by this point, we are now up to April of 2000. He would then lose it to Crash Holly, who would hold it for 47 days for losing it to Jerry Lynn. Held it for another month before losing it to Jeff Hardy, who held it for three weeks before losing it to X-Pac, who had a 42-day reign, during which time he also defeated Billy Kidman for the WCW Cruiserweight Championship, as we are now into the WCW Invasion era. Tajiri would win, then win the Light Heavyweight Championship from X-Pac, although X-Pac's Cruiserweight Championship was not on the line in the match. The two of them would meet, then meet 13 days later at SummerSlam before losing it to X-Pac during a title... Um, okay, wait a minute. Hold on, we got a few notes. Okay. So Tajiri... Tajiri... 
Tajiri had won the light heavyweight championship. During that time, he did win the Cruiserweight Championship as well in a separate match before losing that belt to Billy Kidman. X-Pac then won the Light Heavyweight Championship at SummerSlam before Tajiri regained the WCW Cruiserweight Championship and the two met in a title unification match at Survivor Series in which... X-Pac was considered the final champion of the light heavyweight reign. The title is officially deactivated in March 8th of 2002. For records, because this is one of the few belts that did have a lot of champions and a lot of uh, reigns that were actually worth noting. Counting both eras... Villain 03 held the belt for the longest at 2,040 days. Um, the longest reign under the WWE era of 448 days would only be 5th ranked. And the shortest reign of both eras is Scotty Tuhati's 8-day reign. The most number of reigns is tied between Villain 03 and the combined day, second day rank here of Pero Aguayo, who both held, held the title seven times. So there you go, folks. That is your list of often overlooked, mostly because didn't always stay in this country or it was from eras where you didn't have weekly television on a national level, let alone TV that was habitually recorded and preserved or really reliable wrestling journalism documentation. Several title belts that did exist, some of which had continued to have a legacy influence to this day, and some of which were, like that Canadian Championship, blink and you miss them. Still, it's been a fun ride. And we will discuss more wrestling title history as well as, as I said, the aforementioned Tiger Mask and um, J-Crown concepts, which get a little weird. But we're going to get there and we're going to make it all make sense. Still, we do thank you all for watching as always. Please subscribe to the channel. Hit your notification bell so as soon as new... Friday Ramblings, as well as our other show's debut, you can know and you can watch. Excited. The suspense will get you. But you know the suspense is only going to last seven days, because I am here every Friday with another rambling as we cover many, many forms of entertainment. Please feel free to comment, especially if you have any recommendations for future video topics. Remember, though, that we do not discuss things in a overly critical or negative light here at Roulette Productions. We always look at the silver lining to the storm cloud. After all, if you want people ranting instead of rambling and even flat out hating, there are plenty of avenues for that. We like to do things a little bit differently here at Roulette Productions. So, we thank you for watching. See you in seven. Mwah.